Hey everybody, so I'm here today with my friend Ben and he has a personal paranormal experience that he's going to share with you guys. Yeah, so um, when I was about 10 years old, we were living in Longview, Washington and um, we, for I guess the best way to explain it is we lived in a group of duplexes at that time and these duplexes were, uh, there were three of them and they were kind of shaped uh, in a horseshoe kind of shape. Um, and the particular one we lived in was closest to the, the street. And we moved in there and um, I had to share a room just like most kids do with their, you know, their sibling. And one night um, I'm laying there and my bed actually sat really, really close to the closet. I mean, we're talking within inches of that closet. Um, and so, just like any other kid out there, I made sure that door was religiously closed. And this particular night, I closed the door, laid down, was sleeping or getting ready to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, I feel wind like hit the back side of me because my back was to the closet. And uh, I thought the first thing that came through my mind was that the window, which was also on that same wall where that closet was, uh, was open. Um, and so I roll over to look at that, and that's when I saw that the closet was open and there was a light on. One thing to know is there was no light bulb in that closet. So I roll over and the, the closet's open about a foot or so. And uh, again, I'm about a foot away from this closet tops. And I see this girl standing right in the closet and there's a dim lit light on inside the closet and she's got blonde hair. She's wearing a baby blue dress and she's got a patch over her left eye. And she's doing this with her fingers and telepathically she's speaking to me and all I hear her saying is, um, you know, come with me. And I'm mortified at what's, uh, you know, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. And I can't even scream, I can't speak, uh, do anything. I'm almost paralyzed with fear. So what I do is I roll over and um, the uh, I keep hearing her, you know, talk to me. And I can feel that, that wind hitting the back of my neck. And finally I get enough nerve to roll back over and look at the door. And just as I do that, I see the door, it's about now only an inch open, which it should have been closed all along the whole time. And um, uh, the light is like dimming out in there. And, and I could actually, at this point, I see that the clothes have been kind of like manipulated by the same wind that I was feeling. So they were kind of coming to a rest. Mm -hmm. And she was no longer there. And that's the moment where um, everything comes back to you, you know how to run and scream and <laughs> I jumped up and I don't think my feet hit the ground for the first 10 feet and I'm screaming like a banshee. This is where it gets weird. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to have that kind of a personal experience, but you don't, you don't know what's in store when you actually decide to like research it. And because they saw so much conviction in my you know, telling of this story. And we, I grew up in a home that was very open to the concept of supernatural phenomena and ghostly, you know, talk. So they, they knew that it wasn't like one of those things where I had been watching a show and was scared. I was never that kind of kid. Um, this was a bona fide, you know, experience. And I was trying to convey that. So, um, we start doing a little bit of research and it starts by just talking to neighbors. And we just so happened, uh, directly across from us was a, a, a gentleman that lived in a duplex and we, we were chatting with him. We we're like, look, you know, do you know anything about any, you know, weird spirits or ghosts, you know, going on? And he says, no, not that I know of, but all I can tell you is about two, three years before you moved in, just kitty corner of you in the same group of duplexes, a girl was murdered. She was a 14 year old girl who was blonde haired, was wearing a baby blue dress when she was murdered. And the guy that murdered her actually got off scot-free uh, for her murder, even though they had 
her blood on his zipper of his jeans. She was stabbed like 30, 40 times and raped and um, in that duplex adjacent to me. So then that prompted us to go speak with a, um, a, a, a psychic medium and that individual told us that she was stuck in limbo and that what she was trying to do was get me to join her. And so then we were like, well, what would have happened if Ben would have said yes? You know, when she was saying, you know, come with me, uh, what would have happened if he would have actually, you know, done that? Uh, you know, we hypothesized that basically I would have had some medical explanation of leaving me as a vegetable. My soul would have gone with her, but my physical shell would have remained. Huh. So then we uh, went to the local library and actually started going through all the, uh, the microfiche. And that's when we found Melissa Marchant. And, and actually, Melissa Marchant was 14 years old, blonde-haired girl, was wearing a baby blue dress, and was killed by that guy in the adjacent apartment for me. And when I saw her picture in the newspaper, uh, it freaked me out. I mean, huh. I was absolutely uh, astounded uh, and it, it, it was such concrete proof that there's no way in hell I could have ever known who she was, anything about her story. And here she shows up in our duplex, you know, trying to talk to me. I'm a 10 year old kid and she's wanting to befriend me or something. And, um, and so of course, uh, against my sister's, uh, desires or wishes, uh, our beds got moved. So she got put by the closet, <laughs> which is a really messed up deal. But, um, uh, and I got moved across the room. I only had one other dream and it was more, I think, uh, uh, or experience, I should say. And I, I think it was more a dream. And it was just a dream of me walking down the street, classic haunted house, and, uh, you know, boarded up, you know, kind of windows kind of deal, big full moon behind it. And then all of a sudden the boards shatter and it was like her, but in like your classic ghostly tapered body shape. And they were screaming in this weird, eerie, high pitched noise as they flew slithered up towards the moon. And I, again, I more credit that to being uh, a dream and me just being kind of traumatized from the whole, whole ordeal. But um, yeah, so that, that was an experience that has stuck with me all my life. Uh, very, very profound and was one of those that I feel like told me, in fact, there was something real behind, you know, that because of how it went down, so, yeah. What, what about the eye patch thing? Did you figure that out? Yeah, I'm glad you bring that back up. Um, because that didn't make any sense. It wasn't like her eye was injured. It wasn't, wasn't like that in her living life or anything. Um, the only thing that, again, was hypothesized was maybe it was a symbolic gesture, or, you know, meaning behind it. I, but we don't know. Huh. Can't tell you why she had a patch and it was over her left eye. Turn a blind eye to something or bear witness to something. Yeah, maybe the, behind it was the truth behind what happened. Because he still lives in Longview in the same house that he has lived in his whole life. And um, I can tell you this much. And just in the last couple of years, me kind of circling back and wanting to research this. Um, I've learned that the city of Longview is, has done a very good job at covering this up, trying to erase as much information uh, as possible. It just so happens that one of my friends um, happened to be family of hers. And so weird that I, as I start, you know, telling people about this, she's like, um, <laughs> you know, that was family of my, you know, mine. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, uh, very bizarre, but don't know what the patch was, have no idea. Huh. Was there any part of you that felt compelled to go? With her? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Uh, I was so absolutely frightened. Um, I remember thinking to myself, you know, um, 
well, my thought was that she was some kind of demon in disguise trying to uh, lure me. Um, and this kind of ties in with what I was telling you before that, you know, my most personal experience with uh, a demonic entity that actually was attached to me for years, it was, it was actually still a part of my life at this point. It was from about seven years or eight years of age till I was about um, almost 13 or around there. So, I mean, I had this thing tormenting me in my life and that's why my first thought was that it was that entity. But because it ended up being her and it, nothing physical happened to me because I was having physical things happen to me, um, that I believe that uh, this was purely a separate deal. It had nothing to do with that particular entity, that it was really her uh, trying to reach out, you know, maybe she, I, I don't know what it's like in limbo. Maybe she's bored and she needs a friend, you know, but that's why I want to go back and I actually want to do an investigation. And I talked with the tenants at the time that were living there. Don't know if they're still there now, but they actually agreed. Not only the tenant that had the house or is living in the place where she was actually murdered, but the tenant in my old duplex agreed to allow me to do a joint investigation where, you know, yeah. I tried to, I figured if, if she felt that interested to talk to me then, she may, if she's even around still, she might be interested in talking to me now, you know. Um, I just want to help her move on because she, she's clearly a victim, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I want her to know that she doesn't have to stay there. You know, she can, you know, hopefully move forward. And she didn't get justice if he's still... Yeah, and that's the other thing. She may be very tormented in herself um, because of a result of the fact that he's still going about his normal life and doing what he's done. And And who knows, maybe she might be able to confirm and actually give me an EVP and say... He killed me, you know, say her name or his name um, on audio. So, you want me to... so my nonprofit is called Autonomous Studies of the Enigmatic and Paranormal, which is a mouthful. The acronym is ASEP, A-S-E-P. Um, the website is a-sep.org. Um, and then there's ASEP.org on, um, on Facebook. So if you go to facebook.com forward slash ASEP.org, you'll find me there. Uh, but through my website, you can also get my blog, which in turn also will lead you to my own uh, radio, ASAP Radio. Um, and I have a Twitter account on there. Um, and I don't have a MySpace page anymore. I kind of finally <laughs> decided to leave the early 2000s behind. Um, you still have an AOL email. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> so that's pretty much it. I'm not going to give you my, my uh, screen name for uh, Plenty of Fish. No. <laughs> I have a girlfriend. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. I love you. <laughs> so I'll put all the links down below in the description so you can check all of his shit out there. And... We'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Hey, so I'm here today with my friend Ben Ro Robeson. I almost said it wrong. <laughs> Shit, I almost said Robotessin. Okay. Robeson. Robeson. Yeah. Okay. So I'm here today with my friend Ben Robeson. Shit, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be awesome. I was gonna say like Ben. I'm just saying Ben. I'm your last name is gone. It's it's dead. You don't need to know who I am, sucker. <laughs>